Today, uh, we have the pleasure of uh, having Professor Olivier Polkwi um, from the Department of uh, Genetics at uh, Harvard Medical School. And he's also a professor of pathology at the Brigman, uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital. He was the director of the Institute for um, Genetics and Molecular and Cell Biology in France. And before that, a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigators at the Stowers um, Institute for Medical Research in Kansas City. Um, so, Professor Polkwi authored more than 100 um, peer-reviewed publications. He is an elected member of European Molecular Biology Organization and of the Academia Europea. His work on the uh, segmentation clock that controls the periodicity of um, vertebrae was recognized as one of the milestones in developmental biology of the 20th century by Nature magazine. So, without further ado, uh, let's welcome uh, Prof Professor Polkwi, and his uh, talk will be The Segmentation Clock, a Molecular Oscillator Controlling the Periodic Arrangement of Vertebrate. Basically, what I, I want to discuss is uh, the process whereby the body plan of many animals, and especially vertebrates, which is the, the, the type of animals we're studying, is, uh, the, is established during embryogenesis. And, and we're focusing uh, today on one particular aspect, which is this periodic organization of the vertebral column that is shown on the top uh, panel, and which is called segmentation or, or metamery. And so this pattern is not is, that, is, is the microphone working? Okay. So, so this, uh, this segmented pattern is, is not specific to uh, vertebrates. As you can see, it's also found in many other animals. Below is, a, is a, an annelid worm. And, um, <clears throat> and so this, uh, this specific uh, organization is established during embryogenesis. And so just uh, I would like to... There's no pointer? You think? Oh, it's going one. So this particular organization is, is established uh, uh, during embryogenesis, and I just want to start uh, by uh, thanks a lot. Uh, to start by reminding you about how this process works in, in vertebrates. So in vertebrates, the, the the way the body axis forms is starting from the head and then progressively elongating the more posterior structures, and so there is a a, a zone, a, a so-called growth zone, which initially corresponds to the primitive streak in amniotes, and then becomes the, later on the tail bud. And you can think about this growth zone as a meristem of a plant. It's, it's just where the cells are produced. And so the cells that are produced by this growth zone will feed this uh, steep old area here, which I call the, the patterning zone. And that's where the, the genetic instructions that will specify the pattern that will be uh, subsequently elaborated uh, are uh, um, established. And so and then the final pattern is, is uh, established. It's just the cellular machinery reading the, the genetic instruct, is instructions established uh, here. And so this, this process is continuously ongoing, at least for, for some time during embryogenesis. And while the embryo uh, uh, extends, as shown here, uh, there is um, uh, the, the, the concomitant addition of uh, this so-called segment, these um, uh, uh, periodic structures that will uh, as we will see, give rise to the, the vertebrae and other segmented uh, uh, structures of the embryo. So in vertebrates uh, that we'll discuss today, the, uh, uh, the segments, the embryonic segments, which are shown here and which are called the somites, uh, derive from a tissue which is called the, the paraxial mesoderm. So the paraxial mesoderm is this red tissue here. This is an embryo at two days of development. You can see the head, the actual structure, which will form the spinal cord. Uh, this is the, the forming heart. And, and these uh, uh, structures uh, will give rise to uh, the, the segmented structures of the uh, axial skeleton and the ribs, and also to all the skeletal muscle of the, the body axis. So the somites themselves derive from a tissue which is called the presomitic mesoderm, and I will discuss at length uh, today the, pan the patterning mechanism that take place in the presomitic mesoderm and lead to uh, the, the production of these uh, pre periodic structures. The presomitic mesoderm itself derived from the uh, process of uh, uh, gastrulation, uh, which is uh, ongoing in the tail bud and results in the continuation of the, the production of this tissue. This uh, is the, the growth zone that I just uh, uh, showed you. So 
So this is now a comparison between the, the cartoon, just to re-emphasize uh, uh, this tissue, the presomitic mesoderm. This is a real uh, chicken embryo at two days. A lot of what I'm going to tell you, at least in, in the first part, has been done uh, in the chicken and mouse embryos. So, so these embryos are very similar. The, the chicken is, is a bit more flat than the mouse is, but it's uh, very similar also to human embryos. <clears throat> and um, you can see here this, uh, these embryonic somites. This is the presomitic mesoderm, and this is uh, the tail bud. And so the formation of the somite shows a number of very uh, striking characteristics. One of the most striking that I'll discuss uh, at length is the, the rhythmicity of their production. So <clears throat> in, in um, each species, new pairs of somite are added with a defined rhythm, and this rhythm is characteristic of the species. So in chicken embryos, this rhythm is 90 minutes. In mouse, it's two hours. In fish, it's 30 minutes. So it, it varies depending on the species. The, the pairs of somites are, are rhythmically added in a sequential direction, so from head to tail. And so there is a, a, a progressive addition until the total number of segments is reached. And this number is also specific of the species. And it can vary between uh, 30 somites in zebrafish to more than 300 in snakes. And then another interesting feature, which I won't discuss here, is the fact that the, these structures are, are um, bilaterally symmetrical, which uh, raises, of course, a number of uh, uh, questions with respect to the coordination of uh, these developmental mechanisms between the left and the right side. So today I will uh, mostly address the, the question of the, the rhythmicity of the somite production and the molecular control of the rhythmicity and how it coordinates with the uh, uh, the sequential production or the translation of this rhythmicity into a spatial profile. So I just want to go through a few slides of uh, introduction to uh, tell you a bit what happened to the somites and how they uh, differentiate once they are formed. So these are uh, transverse sections uh, of uh, embryos, uh, say chicken embryos, but uh, mouse or human would be essentially similar. Uh, showing the, the somites, which when they're formed are epithelial spheres that enclose a mesenchymal core. So they are called paraxial because they flank the axial organs of the embryo, the neural tube and the notochord. And uh, uh, quickly, the, the somites uh, differentiate into two compartments, a dorsal compartment, which is epithelial, and is called the dermomyotome, and the ventral uh, compartment, which becomes mesenchymal, and is called the sclerotome. The dermomyotome will form the dermis of the back and the skeletal muscles, while the sclerotome will form first the, cartilag the cartilaginous template that will uh, serve for the formation of the vertebrae. And then progressive ossification occurs, as shown here in red, and the cartilage template is, is replaced by uh, bones. And, and so now you have a, an axial skeleton, so vertebrae with ribs, and uh, their associated uh, skeletal muscles. The, uh, the, the formation of the vertebrae is, uh, uh, <clears throat> is complicated in the sense that it's not as simple as one somite give rise to one vertebra. There is a shift such that uh, a vertebra is in reality formed from the fusion of the posterior part of one somite with the anterior part of the next consecutive somite. And so this process, which was uh, described in the 19th century by Remak, is called the resegmentation. And, uh, and, and it has some important consequences uh, uh, in the sense that uh, the, this resegmentation implies that the somite is subdivided into an anterior and a posterior compartment that will give rise to two different vertebrae. But uh, uh, not only that, these compartments are also differently permissive to the migration of the motor axons, so the peripheral nervous system, and uh, the, the neural crest. And so, so it will also result in the uh, uh, the, impose the segmentation of the nervous system because the axons of the motor neurons and the neural crest cells can only migrate in the anterior part of the somite and the, the, the posterior part is completely uh, um, refractory to their migration. And so this, uh, 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 the, the resegmentation pattern is uh, uh, providing the, the template on which a second set of a structure will be uh, segmented, namely the, the nervous system. And this is <clears throat> Just to show you a, a movie of a human embryo where you will see the segmentation of the nervous system, you see here, uh, uh, these are the, the dorsal root ganglia, and you can see very clearly uh, the segmental pattern which is imposed by the somites. Uh, 
So this is true not only for the nervous system, this is also true for the, the blood vessels. You can see here all these uh, intersegmental uh, aorta that, are, uh, uh, that, that show this nice uh, periodic organization, which is uh, also imposed by the somatic segmentation. So basically, what I'm, I'm, I'm telling you is that uh, the, the, the formation of the somite is really the primary uh, uh, segmentation event, and that's all this uh, subsequent uh, uh, refinement of these patterns are established later, uh, secondarily, to uh, the, the formation of the somites. And so what we are trying to understand here is really what controls the uh, <coughs> establishment of this original periodicity. So this is a, a cartoon and a, a movie that uh, illustrates uh, the formation of the somites. In a, this is a chicken embryo in time-lapse movie. And you can see here the rhythmic addition of pairs of somites at the tip of the presomitic mesoderm. <coughs> you can see that this occurs while the embryo is elongating. This is the same thing in a real embryo. You see the rhythmic addition of the pairs of somites that take place while uh, the embryo uh, axis is uh, forming. And so for a long time, we've been trying to understand the molecular control of this uh, uh, rhythmic process. <coughs> and um, in the 70s, there was a, a model which has been proposed by uh, Jonathan Cook and Chris Zeman. <coughs> Jonathan Cook was a developmental biologist working on, on uh, Xenopus. And Chris Zeman was a mathematician, very interested in the mathematical theory of catastrophes. And, uh, and uh, what he uh, uh, proposed is that the formation of the somite resulted from a, <coughs> a, 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 a catastrophe that would be like a, a, an abrupt transition, for instance, between a, a two st a stable steady state, a bistable transition. And, uh, and in order to make this catastrophe periodic, they proposed uh, the existence of an, an oscillator that would drive the, the catastrophe. And so <coughs> uh, 20 years uh, after or so, we identified the uh, uh, genes that show a rhythmic expression in the presomitic mesoderm and, and suggesting that there is indeed such an oscillator. And so the, the, the prototype of uh, these genes was a transcription factor called the HERI1. And what happens is that uh, this is the, the sequence that corresponds to the formation of one somite. You see here you have one somite and here another one which forms. So this is a 90 minutes time window in the chicken embryo. And in blue, what you see is the expression domain of this transcription factor, so for the messenger RNA of this transcription factor. So you see that initially it's expressed as a broad domain, and this domain moves and narrows uh, anteriorly as the somite progressively forms. And you can see this in real embryos at 15, 16, or 17 somites. These embryos have been stained uh, uh, in situ by in-situ hybridization with probes against this, uh, uh, the gene coding for this transcription factor. And so this is this broad domain corresponding to this. That's the tail bud, and this is the somite. <coughs> and um, you see that within embryo that are synchronized within uh, this, the formation of one somite, so 15 somites, the, the stripe has moved up here and now even further up here. And this sequence is reiterated each time you form a new somite. And so if you look at this, this is a simulation performed by Julian Lewis of this uh, dynamic expression, which shows you how it looks like in, in more dynamical terms. And so you see these this dynamic traveling waves that sweep across the presomitic mesoderm, that is the, the, the precursors of the somites, each time a new segment is, is going to form. And so this uh, 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 led to the uh, uh, identification of the molecular oscillator that we call the, the, verti the segmentation clock. <clears throat> and so work from, from my lab, but from also many others, led to the identification of, of uh, the, the, the molecular network that is associated to these uh, oscillations. And, uh, and we could show, for instance, that it involves at least three major signaling pathways, namely the FGF, the uh, fibroblast growth factor signaling pathway, the notch pathway, and the wind pathway. <clears throat> and so what uh, we and others found is that many of the cyclic genes that are expressed with this uh, periodic traveling waves in the embryo are actually targets of these pathways. And that's the case, for instance, for the dust, strati, uh, 
uh, uh, SNAIL, Lunatic Fringe, HES, NKD, Axin2, and so on, which are uh, uh, targets of these different pathways, but not only targets, they are also negative feedback inhibitors, meaning that uh, the, these pathways which are uh, triggered either by soluble ligands like FGF or WIND or by membrane-bound ligands like a notch, uh, uh, these pathways, when activated, will activate the expression of negative feedback inhibitors that will shut down uh, the activation of the pathway. And so this, uh, uh, this led to, to uh, the proposal that uh, what controls these oscillations are such a negative uh, feedback inhibition loop. So, so, and, and one of the most famous ones is, is based on uh, the family of transcription factor that I just described, the hairy uh, um, transcription factors, wherein the, uh, uh, these factors are able to uh, shut down their own expression and so what uh, Julian Lewis proposed is that they're um, uh, triggering a, a negative feedback loop with delay that sustains the oscillations. I should say that what is, you'll find in most textbooks are, uh, this is the way the oscillations are triggered. In my view, this is uh, not uh, demonstrated still. What is clear, though, is that all these uh, uh, pathway components are oscillating and are involved in some feedback loops, whether they're acting as pacemakers or not is, I think, still an open question. So, so that's the, the clock. So, so the idea is that these uh, periodic waves define a temporal periodicity that will be used by the embryo uh, to uh, be converted into a spatial periodicity of the, the somites, of the segments. But then you need a second system for that, and the system was shown to involve a set of posterior gradients of uh, uh, wind and FGF signaling. And so these uh, ligands for these pathways are expressed uh, as a posterior to anterior gradient. This is the tailbud here in these embryos. These are the somites. So this is posterior, this is anterior. You see here there's strong expression of the FGF ligand, then establishing a gradient of signaling. This is a readout of FGF signaling, which is distributed in gradient. And this is a readout of wind signaling, nuclear beta-catenin, which tells us that wind signaling is prominently activated in the posterior part of the embryo. So here in this posterior region of the embryo, you have very strong activation of wind and FGF signaling, and that prevents these cells to respond to the clock. So meaning that only when the cells reach a particular threshold, which we call determination front, only when they reach this level, they become competent to respond to the clock signal. And when they uh, pass the threshold and they get hit by the clock signal, they start to activate segmentation genes. And this is what is shown more dynamically on this cartoon, where you have illustrated the two components, namely the, the wave front and this FGF wind gradient, and the clock, which is this blue, periodic blue traveling wave. And what you see is that the cells that passed the, the front during the previous cycle, when they get hit by the wave, they start to activate these segmentation genes in black. And so once they activate these genes, then they define the future segments, the posterior and the anterior boundaries of the future segment. And so this system, which is inspired from this, the original clock and wavefront component of the, the, the theoretical cook zeeman model, uh, leads to the uh, uh, sequential and rhythmic uh, specification of stripes of gene activation that will become the future somite and impose the periodic organization of the vertebrae. <clears throat> so, the, uh, uh, in order to, to study this um, uh, process in more detail, we've started over the years to develop more sophisticated tools um, uh, to particularly to, to uh, image these oscillations. And, uh, but before I, I, I go there, I just want to uh, summarize a bit what I've told you and, and, and try to uh, exemplify the, the different levels at what, which should consider the organization of this system. So the first one is the, um, uh, the, the level of the single cells. So for a long time, we've been thinking that the presomitic mesoderm uh, was composed of cells that harbor intrinsic oscillators, these intrinsic oscillators being driven, being driven by the sort of negative feedback loop with delay that I mentioned, uh, uh, downstream of, of uh, uh, transcriptional repressors able to negatively regulate their own uh, rep expression. So the, the HER-S uh, uh, family. Uh, 
And then uh, uh, locally, you need some sort of synchronization, and this was proposed to be downstream of the notch pathway that would uh, synchronize oscillate, oscillations between nearby cells. And then you need a further uh, level of the, the tissue level in order to generate the, these traveling waves with their specific dynamics, uh, because the wave actually slow down as they approach uh, the, the, the segmentation uh, region, meaning that there is a, a, a frequency gradient which is established along the tissue. And so <clears throat> we've uh, uh, set out to, to study these uh, different levels, and for that we wanted to uh, develop some tools. So one of the first uh, tools we developed was uh, uh, a fluorescent reporter, a, a mouse, a transgenic mouse, in which uh, the promoter of one of the cyclic genes, which is activated periodically, was fused to a destabilized fluorescent protein, a Venus, which is a YFP protein. And, uh, and then a transgenic mouse was uh, engineered by Alexander Olela when he was in, in the lab. And this is uh, what you see here is a, is a mouse embryo on the stage of a two-photon microscope. This is lying on the side, so this is the left side that you see. That's the, the tail bud here. This is uh, uh, posterior and then progressively more anterior. You see here the somites. And you see the last somite is here. The presomitic mesoderm is here. And uh, <clears throat> what you see are these traveling waves of uh, lunatic fringe expression. You see this, uh, these dynamic waves. And uh, so that's, that's uh, very clear the, in the beginning of the movie. You see here the waves, and the waves stop as a stripe, as I showed you on the movies previously. So, so uh, uh, that the stripe corresponding to the domain where the future segment is uh, specified. And so, importantly, notch is a, uh, a lunatic fringe is a well-known notch target, meaning that what you see here is actually the dynamic activation of this signaling pathway, which is uh, remarkably coordinated, as you see. So <clears throat> what we wanted to do <clears throat> in order to dissect uh, this system uh, uh, better was to uh, establish an in vitro system. And, and the ideal system would be to be able to generate a homogeneous population of cells that would exhibit synchronized oscillation. That, that was our ultimate goal. And so what I want to show is the sort of progress that we made uh, uh, progressively toward this goal. So the first uh, uh, in vitro system that we developed was uh, 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 following uh, a protocol that was established by uh, Alexander Olela, who is now in his uh, own lab at Embo, who uh, showed that if you take the, the tailbot part of the reporter mouse that I just uh, showed you, put it in culture, it will uh, uh, show oscillations in two dimensions, meaning that you can, in principle, recapitulate uh, these oscillations in a dish. Uh, however, the problem with uh, their system is that uh, it, it really, this explains in the way they are cultured, they exactly recapitulate the normal development. That means they will undergo a few oscillations and then they will stop because they differentiate. And what we wanted is a stable system where we can image a large number of oscillations and where these oscillations are stable. That means when there is no frequency gradient. And so Alex Hubo, who uh, was a PhD student in the lab, uh, uh, optimized the system developed by uh, Alexander Olela and uh, he found conditions wherein he can keep the explants for two days, and, and uh, in these conditions, they maintain the expression of markers of the oscillatory region, like TBX6 or Bracuri, for much longer than they would uh, normally do in vivo. And, and when you look at these explants, uh, what you see is that they experience these uh, 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 periodic traveling waves, so instead of being uh, linear along the axis of the embryo, now they appear as target waves. And remarkably, in these explants, there's no FGF gradient and there's no frequency gradient of the waves. So the period is the same uh, at it, the center and in the periphery of the wave. So, so this was a, a, a great system. So we decided to start to use this to ask a number of questions with respect to the dynamical control of these oscillations. And the first uh, question that uh, Alexi asked is whether <coughs> uh, there were such things as uh, intrinsic oscillators. And for this, uh, what he did is to dissect the table region, dissociate this to single cells, and plate it at low density. And when he does so, as you see here, the cells uh, uh, progressively shut down uh, the reporter, but they do not show oscillations. And this is quantified here. 
you see that the cells exhibit a few bursts, but there are no regular oscillations that are seen. So you could imagine that the cells are actually differentiating and then they stop oscillating. But in fact, if you look at the expression of TBX6 in these cells, and TBX6 is a marker for the oscillatory region, so for the, the posterior presomatic mesoderm, these cells retain the, the presomatic mesoderm identity. It's not that they differentiate. And in fact, if you re-aggregate the cells, so if you do a, a, a culture Overnight, let the cells stop oscillating and then re-aggregate the cells. What you see is that the cells resume oscillating, which means that they didn't lose the ability to oscillate, but they simply, uh, <coughs> they, 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 they simply stopped oscillating. I mean, that's, you can, so basically what this means is that you can shut on and off the oscillations and that it depends on the cell density. So this is just the profile of these uh, re-aggregations. So Alexi looked at this a bit more quantitatively, and for this he used uh, micro patterns, which are uh, micro prints of uh, specific substrates of, of fibronectin, and then he seeded the dissociated cells on these uh, micro patterns and imaged the, um, uh, the, the, the oscillations. The good thing is that uh, there he doesn't get uh, traveling waves, he essentially gets an on off signal. And then he looked at the effect of cell density, and as you see here very clearly, as you increase the cell density, you uh, uh, start to see oscillation. So there is a threshold, which is about at five to uh, seven cells when you start to see uh, oscillations in this context. So clearly that was uh, indicating that um, in these uh, conditions, the oscillations are uh, dependent on cell density and that they required a, a signal, like a, a type of quorum sensing uh, signal in order to trigger oscillations. And so the important conclusion of these experiments, as I uh, told you, is that the cells can exist either in a quiescent or in an oscillatory state. So they don't have such a thing as, a, as an intrinsic oscillator, meaning that these oscillations more likely reflect a dynamical property of the system uh, rather than an intrinsic oscillator. We don't see a, a dedicated pacemaker. I don't have time to show you these experiments. Uh, also, importantly, the, the, the fact that uh, we could see traveling waves in the absence of the frequency gradient was uh, uh, puzzling. And as I'll show you in one second, I think now we have a, a better conceptual framework that allows to explain uh, this. So the conclusion was that oscillations are uh, an emergent property of the, the population and not an intrinsic uh, characteristic of the cells. So then we started to discuss with Madhavan, who's a physicist uh, on the Harvard campus in, in Cambridge, and who suggested that uh, these uh, results could be uh, interpreted by considering that the clock functions as an excitable system. And so as you know, excitable systems, and this is illustrated for a pendulum, they can uh, exist either as a, a quiescent state, like we showed for the, the, the presomatic mesoderm cells, and then depending on the nature of the stimulus, if you have like a, a small stimulus which is below a certain excitability threshold, the system will go back to its uh, uh, steady state. But if you uh, uh, apply a stimulus that allows the system to cross this excitability threshold, then it will go for a long excursion and uh, during which uh, it's going to be uh, refractory for further stimulation. So there are several examples of such uh, uh, um, excitable systems in biology. The most uh, well known is, is are the, the, the action potentials of neurons, but there are also systems like the hard calcium waves on the cyclic um, IMP oscillations of dictyostelium. So we decided to start to uh, uh, validate better the, this idea that the clock might act as an excitable system. For that, uh, Alexi first looked at uh, uh, trying to provide evidence, although it's indirect evidence, for the existence of a refractory period. And to do that, what he did is to confront two explants and see what happened as the interface. The prediction would be that uh, the uh, waves would annihilate at the interface. And indeed, that's what he observed. So these are the, the, the two explants uh, next to each other. So you see they grow toward one another, they will meet at the interface here, and uh, what you see is that at the interface, the waves are not crossing onto the other sides. They uh, die at the interface, which is consistent, doesn't demonstrate, but it's consistent 
with the existence of a refractory period. Then we wondered about the stimulus. And so the system I showed you, this reporter is a notch reporter. So a very obvious candidate was notch signaling. So notch is this pathway which is activated by a transmembrane ligand called delta, which, uh, 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 which when it binds to the notch receptors, leads to the cleavage of the, 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 the receptor at the transmembrane uh, level, and that releases the intrastoplasmic domain that then moves to the nucleus where it functions as a, as a transcription factor. And so <clears throat> to test the role of notch, what Alexi first did was to block notch signaling by blocking the cleavage of the receptor. So he treated with a drug called DAPT, and as you see here, when he does so, you essentially lose the oscillations. This is the quantification. Is, which is consistent with the idea that notch is necessary for the oscillations. Interestingly, he did the, the converse experiment where he blocked the oscillations with DAPT, and then he released the block by moving the cells to control medium. And what uh, we see here is that the cells immediately start to re-oscillate in synchrony, which is a behavior which is quite well explained by uh, excitable properties and not by other uh, models. Um, the, so, so notch appears to be necessary, and the next question was whether this was sufficient for the oscillations. And to test that, what uh, Alex did was to coat slides with uh, the, the delta ligand to promote uh, notch activation, and then culture the cells on this uh, uh, ligand, and then look at the oscillations. And then in this case, as you see here, there is no oscillations on the cells, despite the fact that notch is activated. So he, he verified that in these cells, the targets of notch signaling are, are on, which means that it works. The ligand activates the pathway, but it's not enough to trigger the oscillations. What he found while he, while he was doing these experiments is that he, he used as a negative control a BSA, a coating of BSA, which is a very poorly ad adhesive substrate compared to uh, a fibronectin. And what he found is that in this context, the cells were actually resuming oscillations. So this was a bit unexpected because it was this negative control. But okay. as you see here, uh, uh, when they are cultured on BSA, the cells show nice oscillations with the appropriate period, the species-specific period of uh, about two hours. So, so this led us to, to scratch our head for a while. And, uh, <clears throat> and then Alexei realized that uh, uh, a big difference between cells cultured on fibronectin and on uh, a BSA is the organization of their cytoskeleton. And, uh, and, and particularly, the cells on BSA are very rounded, and, uh, whereas the cells on, on fibronectin are, are completely flat. And, uh, and, and this is known, uh, the, the cell spreading is known to activate uh, a particular mechanosensing pathway, which is the, the YAP or HIPPO pathway, whereas uh, on BSA, this confined cell adhesion and different organization of the, uh, uh, the cortical cytoskeleton is known to result in YAP being inactive. So YAP is this pathway, so YAP is a, is a, a transcriptional co-activator which uh, binds a partner called TAS, and normally it's phosphorylated by the HIPPO complex and gets degraded, but uh, when the HIPPO complex gets inhibited or in response to uh, signals that are still poorly characterized downstream of the F-actin polymerization, uh, YAP gets uh, stopped being phosphorylated and then gets stabilized and moved to the nucleus where it drives uh, expression of target genes. And so uh, what Alexi uh, verified is that the cells cultured on fibronectin uh, show uh, YAP on, which means YAP is in the nucleus in these cells, whereas the cells co uh, cultured on BSA show a YAP pathway which is off. And, uh, <clears throat> and I'm not showing you all the uh, data, but uh, he showed that uh, uh, indeed that a difference between the cells that uh, show oscillations and not is the fact that they have uh, um, uh, YAP activated, suggesting that YAP activation prevents uh, the cells to oscillate. And then he did an experiment to test this functionally where he blocked YAP signaling using latrancoline A, which is an inhibitor of uh, uh, actin polymerization. And then uh, when you treat the fibronating cells that stopped oscillating with this drug, you see that the cells round up, but uh, uh, very strikingly, they uh, resume oscillations, even isolated cells. So this is what you see here. 
And these uh, oscillations that you see in individual cells uh, exhibit a period which is the normal period of the mouse embryo. So <clears throat> what was even further surprising is that when you treat these isolated cells with uh, La Tranquiline, you restore the oscillations, as I told you, but if you block notch signaling in these conditions, you don't block the oscillations. And, and we don't very understand uh, really how this works, but I'll give you at least a theoretical explanation for that. So the way we interpret this data is in the context of an excitable system, uh, uh, saying that uh, in normal uh, cells, like in explants, for instance, uh, the notch stimulus is enough for the cells to cross uh, an excitability threshold, which is controlled by uh, YAP signaling. And so that leads to this dynamic response, and because the notch stimulus is sustained, that will lead to oscillations. Now, when you culture the cells on fibronectin, what you do is that you increase YAP signaling. So you increase the excitability threshold, and in this context, your notch signaling is not enough to trigger uh, uh, the oscillations of the system, and so the cells don't oscillate. And, and interestingly also, that allows you to explain why uh, um, when you get rid of uh, YAP signaling, then you get rid of the excitability threshold, then the system becomes hyper-excitable. And so that's why then uh, in these isolated cells treated with flat tranquiline, you see oscillations even if you block notch signaling, just the noise would be uh, sufficient to activate the system. And of course, what's, what's interesting with this uh, excitable dynamics is that there is a, 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 a lot of literature and, and, uh, on, the, on, on these systems. And so uh, Alexei used, for instance, the, the well-known uh, Fitzhugh Nagumo model, which was developed for uh, action potentials to model uh, the, 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 the system that I described. And, and you can essentially recapitulate all uh, the experiments just uh, by uh, uh, postulating that uh, a notch acts as a, uh, the current in the, the Fitzhugh Nagumo model as part of the, the stimulator of this uh, activator. Uh, U and uh, and um, uh, YAP is uh, involved in the definition of the, uh, the 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 excitability threshold, and so what what I find interesting here for for us is also that it allows us to make prediction. I mean, the system usually are characterized by a fast activation and a slow inhibition, and so that imposes some constraints on uh, on the the regulatory network and and will guide us for the, the dissect the biology of the system. So <clears throat> now I'd like to move to the, the next step, uh, which is trying to move one further step uh, in vitro. And so in, I, I've not told you, but in, in human, we know that uh, mutations of genes associated to the segmentation clock, like lunatic fringe, delta-3, S7, MES2, leads to this very severe set of diseases called congenital scoliosis. And so, which uh, tells us that uh, the, the clock is likely to be uh, conserved uh, in humans. And so we decided to uh, use embryonic stem cells or IPS-induced uh, pluripotent stem cells, uh, reprogrammed cells, uh, in order to establish a differentiation system where we would be able to recapitulate uh, the differentiation of the presomitic mesoderm completely in vitro. And there again, the, the, the dream was to be able to produce a pure population of uh, uh, oscillating cells and to freeze them in an oscillatory state. And so <clears throat> we've worked on uh, the development of protocols to differentiate the cells to a presomitic mesoderm fate. For that, we developed a number of fluorescent reporters, which we introduced in, uh, in iPS cell lines. And so the idea is that uh, these uh, reporters are introduced in genes that are specific of these different stages. And when you reach, uh, for instance, this stage here, which is characterized by the expression of mesogenin 1, which is uh, this gene here, so it's, it's expressed only in the oscillatory region. When the cells light up with these genes, that means that they acquired this identity uh, uh, of the embryo. And so we showed that if you activate when signaling and inhibit BMP, so with only two uh, small molecules, you can drive extremely efficiently, uh, efficiently the cells to acquire this, this fate. And uh, <clears throat> this is what is shown here. You see 
day zero, day one, uh, there's no activation of the mesogenin marker, but day two, virtually all the cells start to uh, turn on this uh, uh, presomitic mesoderm marker. And so Margarete Diaz Quadros, who's another uh, uh, PhD student in the lab, started to study this in more detail. And so she looked at the differentiation sequence of uh, these cells. So this is the series I just showed you. And so she compared this to what happens in the embryo. And so she could see, show that uh, <clears throat> after one day in the, in the medium with a wind activator, BMP inhibitor, the cells express both uh, uh, a marker called T and a marker called SOX2, which are respectively expressed in the, in the mesoderm for T and in the neural tube for SOX2. So these cells are called neuromesodermal precursors. In vivo, they are located here in the tail bud. And then uh, the next day, uh, the cells have lost SOX2 expression, and they activated mesogenin, uh, which means that they entered the posterior presomitic mesoderm, which shows that these cells really uh, differentiate very much like uh, uh, what we know of the development of the presomitic mesoderm in the mouse. <clears throat> so we've characterized further this differentiation sequence by performing single cell sequencing. So we used a, 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 a micro droplet uh, sequencing, the, the in drops technique developed in uh, Alan Klein's lab. And we sequenced uh, almost 15,000 cells at day zero, day one, day two, day three, and day four. And if you do unsupervised clustering of uh, these cells, you see that they organize uh, uh, as a function of uh, the, the, the day. Uh, so so they, they cluster essentially by day and they organize as a developmental trajectory which corresponds to uh, the, the age in culture. So the, that's uh, expected, and, and if you look at the genes that are activated, you see that at day one, they activate uh, genes associated to neuromesodermal precursors and anterior primitive streaks, so before gastrulation. Day two, they already correspond to posterior presomitic mesoderms, so oscillating cells. Day three, uh, determination fronts or segmentation and so on. So, so that's very nice. That shows that you know, we get the expected differentiation sequence. What is very striking is the efficiency and the synchronization of the differentiation process. Because as you see here, what this says is that each day you have one single population at one single stage. And, and that means that there is no uh, other populations of cells that are induced by this protocol. It's, it's essentially almost 100% pure posterior presomatic mesoderm, which is uh, generated. And then what Margarete did is to engineer a fluorescent reporter, like the, the mouse that I showed you in the previous work. But in this case, she used the S7 cyclic gene. She knocked in uh, an Achilles, which is a, an optimized version of, of uh, Venus which is more fluorescent and more fast folding. And so she uh, introduced this in the uh, HES7 locus using CRISPR-Cas9 uh, after a TA peptide. So it's not, a, it doesn't cure the S7 gene. And, uh, and um, then she made movies of the differentiating cells at day two. And, and lo and behold, these uh, cells show nice oscillations, up to five oscillations in these conditions. And, and here we are able to uh, uh, identify the period of the human segmentation clock for the first time, which is uh, about five hours. You have to realize that uh, studying segmentation in the human embryo is, is not possible because these embryos, uh, human embryos, um, uh, the, the somatogenesis takes place between three and four weeks, which is a time when uh, women don't even know they're pregnant. So, so there is essentially no data on this, uh, on this process in human. So this also beyond the, the, the tool that it provides us with to dissect the, the mechanism underlying the oscillations also provides a very interesting window uh, into uh, human development. And so now we've uh, further optimized uh, uh, the system to, uh, uh, to better track the oscillations at the level of single cells. And, uh, and, and what you can do is to spike some reporter cells within uh, the, the population the, that was used to generate the, the, the reporter, so the, the paternal line, and the, the parental line. And uh, you see here these, uh, these cells that oscillate in a background of non-labeled cells. So these cells are easier to track. But it's not perfect, because what you see also is that uh, when the cells lose the oscillation, then you lose the actual cells. So it's difficult to track. <clears throat> 
So what Margarete did is to do a double targeting. So she introduced a, a constitutive uh, uh, H2B cherry, which labels the cell nuclei in the cells that also uh, um, have the, the, the oscillation reporter. So this, is, this reports the oscillation, this reports the cells, and now you can do the, the, the spiking experiment, and you can see you can keep tracking the cells even when the oscillation is off. And so now you can really extract some quantitative data, and this is work in progress, so I won't tell you much more than that, but we have the tool now to analyze quantitatively uh, this oscillation in detail. Just, you can just look at this graph. So this is a series of uh, oscillation tracks from single cells in a culture. You can see that if you take the average, it's nicely oscillating, which indicates a high level of synchronization, which we are currently characterizing. And, and another way to use this system is, is by uh, asking a question about the role of the different pathways on uh, the, uh, uh, on the, 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 <coughs> the, the the control and the regulation of the oscillations. And for instance, I told you that uh, the model we had in mind uh, is a model where FGF was uh, defining a threshold at which the oscillation arrests and they, they stop. So, so uh, we decided to test that. And so Margarete uh, treated these oscillating cultures with different concentrations of FGF inhibitors. And what you see is that there's not a threshold effect but in fact, there is a dose-dependent effect. The, the higher the dose, the lower oscillations are taking place, meaning that it's, it's not a simple threshold model, but it's a more complicated uh, role of FGF in the control of the oscillations that uh, we need to understand. And so this is a, a series of conclusions that uh, what I've told you is that we have identified an oscillatory transition triggered by a quorum sensing uh, signal, which depends on notch and yap signaling, and I've not shown you all the data for human, but that's true both in mouse and in, uh, in human. We identified the segmentation clock oscillator in human, which ticks with a period which is two times slower than the period in mouse, and that's known that the, development, the, the time of development for humans is much slower than the time in mouse, so that's, that's to be expected. And, and we also show dynamical properties that are consistent with an excitable system. And um, I don't know if I have five more minutes or if you want me to stop here. It's, it's, uh... Yeah. I, c I can go very quickly. It's just I wanted to show you a kind of translational application of the, the, this type of uh, research. I'll go very So once you've done these this, uh, precursors of the presomatic mesoderm, you can also differentiate them further to a variety of lineages. And, and so we focused on the muscle lineage and we've developed protocols in order to uh, reach these uh, um, uh, this fates, namely the satellite cells, which are the muscle stem cells, and the muscle fibers. And this is uh, shown here. You see these nice uh, striated skeletal muscle fibers and their satellite cells generated in vitro. And using uh, uh, fluorescent reporters, like the strategy I just illustrated for the clock, we uh, uh, were able to optimize the production of uh, these uh, uh, two cell types uh, using human cells, which had not uh, been done before. And you can generate very uh, nice uh, human myofibers. And so what this allows you to do is to establish in vitro models to study diseases that are not very well understood. And so we focused on Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which is a disease in, uh, in which patients are lacking dystrophin, which is a protein that uh, hooks the extracellular matrix to the uh, uh, cytoskeleton. It's, uh, it's a deadly disease, so the kids are uh, will, wheelchair-bound and they die in their mid-20s. So the, 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 the pathology is not very well understood, and so we uh, generated two isogenic lines. So that means we took a parental line and engineered mutations similar to patient mutations in these uh, two lines. And then we looked at the development of these lines, so these are uh, uh, just to show that they lack dystrophin, which is expected, but they develop normally, so these are muscle fibers generated from these dystrophin-deficient cultures. And what we did is to work together with Kit Parker, who's a bioengineer at, uh, at, uh, on the Harvard uh, campus, on the main campus, and uh, we developed this system where they <coughs> can culture cells on cantilever, on soft cantilevers, which are these sort of tongs, 
So what we can do is seed the fibers on this uh, uh, gelatin or PDMS cantilevers, and then they apply a current with these electrodes across uh, the, the, the cantilevers to trigger the contraction of the fibers. And this is what you see here. And, uh, and then from this, you can, uh, by applying currents at different frequencies and, and knowing the, the material properties of the cantilevers, you can extract the contraction force. And so in this way, we were able to show that uh, uh, the, the cells that were lacking dystrophin had a, 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 a significant defect in contraction compared to the wild type. So the two Newton cell lines showed this uh, defect. And so, so we're developing this model, but that provides with a, a, a model that faithfully recapitulates the, the pathology of the disease, something which is not true for the mouse uh, mutant for, for Duchenne, for instance. And I'll stop here. So this is uh, my group. So I've told you about the work of two very talented PhD students, Margarete and, and Alexi, so with some help from Ziad and, uh, and collaborations with uh, Kit Parker and his group, uh, Daniel, Atsushi, Rio, and also uh, uh, Madevan, of course.